Hello and welcome to Worship with Incarnation as we continue to worship as a church without walls. I have just a few announcements before we begin. First, the last gathering of Praise and Prose will be this Wednesday, September 2nd at 6.30 outside on the lawn. So bring a lawn chair, wear your mask, come and enjoy a time of readings and music. The music will be led by our contemporary musicians. So come and, and gather with us there. Next, our weekday communion services will continue on Mondays and Wednesdays at noon through Wednesday, September 16th, except for Labor Day. Because these services are in the sanctuary, we do ask that you go on to the Incarnation website and register if you plan to attend. The Solid Ground Coat Drive and Fall Shower is continuing. This, uh, these initiatives are really so important as we help our neighbors who have experienced homelessness start to build a sense of stability in their lives. So any support you can offer through the donation of coats and household goods are really vital to their efforts. You can drop off items for either the coat drive or for the fall shower this Thursday from 9 a.m. to 12 noon. And then finally, on Sunday, September 13th, just a few weeks away, we will gather outside on the lawn to celebrate the start of a new school year. We'll do that by having blessing of the backpacks and a modified version of the Great Incarnation Fall Get Together. That gathering will be from uh, 9 a.m. until noon. There will be food trucks with a variety of offerings that will be in the front parking lot. Everyone is welcome. So invite your friends, invite your neighbors, bring a lawn chair. Um, come and gather in family groups and enjoy that time of fellowship. We do ask for those who are attending to maintain social distancing and to wear a mask when not eating or drinking. You can find out more information about all of these and other opportunities by um, checking out the links in the uh, worship email that was sent to you or by going to the Incarnation website. We begin our worship with our contemporary team reminding us that Jesus is the source, the focus, the true north of our lives. boys and girls, my name is Kara, and today I want to talk to you about feeling worried and anxious. How many of you are ready for school to start? Are some of you really excited to learn and meet new friends and your teachers? Or maybe some of you are a little anxious or worried about meeting new people and learning from home even. It's okay to have many different feelings about school starting up. I remember the first day of kindergarten. I was so worried that I wasn't going to meet any new friends. I didn't know anyone in class. But 
it turns out I met my best friend Caitlin and I've been friends with her for 30 years. Can you believe that? 30 whole years. The school year might look different for you and you might be missing friends, sports, even, even seeing your teacher in person. Church and Sunday school might even look a little different too. It's important for us to remember that God is with us no matter where we are. In the Bible, in, cha in Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 through 7, the Apostle Paul says, Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Jesus Christ. Wow, that's pretty powerful there. Let's commit these verses to memory and say them maybe when you're worried, when you're anxious, or when you're facing uncertain uh, situations, especially with the school year starting. So I want to leave you guys with a little prayer here about before we start school. Thank you, God, for all the parents and teachers who are going to help with your education. Please give them guidance and wisdom as they help you learn. Please be with all the children as they face uncertainty of the new school year and things looking different. Help relieve their fears and worries and remember to rely on you and your words spoken through the Apostle Paul. Amen. I want to start my sermon by just saying thanks to Kara for doing the children's message. Uh, as you know, by listening to it, it was more than a children's message. It was a message for parents and teachers. Uh, it's a very anxious time, and I was glad that she was able to just articulate from a, a family perspective and a person entering into that system what it's going to be like um, for all of us as we make our way into this fall season. So thank you, Kara, for that message. So we're in Chapter 3, and before I get to that, I just want to take you back to the beginning of the pandemic and the shutdown time. So there was that time when all the sports, March Madness was shut down, the basketball season was shut down, everybody was going crazy. And not long after that, ESPN came out with a 10-part documentary, The Last Dance, and it was about Michael Jordan's uh, championship years with the Chicago Bulls. It was one of those things where my son Anders and I were just absolutely transfixed. It wasn't like Netflix where we could watch 10 hours in a row, but we had to wait every Sunday and every Monday for this to come back again. But it was just fascinating. So I kept thinking to myself, why is this so important to us right now? And one, A, there wasn't sports going on, so I think we both just love that sense of competition. Uh, two, Michael Jordan's a guy of my generation. I mean, I'm basically the same age as Michael Jordan. And uh, let me be honest, um, I really wanted to be like Mike. I really wanted to be like Mike. If you're around at all in the 90s, uh, you probably remember this commercial as uh, Gatorade was trying to sell product, but also trying to sell this image of who Michael Jordan was. Uh, watch this commercial. Sometimes I dream that he is me. Got to see that's how I dream to be. As you watch that commercial, A, I was probably that white guy, you know, in the commercial who was trying to be like Mike and fumbling the ball all over the place. Um, but being like Mike was more than just doing his moves, wasn't it? If you got into the whole Michael Jordan phenomenon, what you realized was this, that it was about uh, the clothes that you wore, it was about the shoes that you purchased. When you were doing his moves, it was about the way that you did them, and uh, his tongue sticking out, people would be doing that all over the place. Uh, his looks, when he'd hit another clutch free throw, or three-pointer, would be like, this is just how it works, you know? People wanted to be like Mike. And what was fascinating about it for me was this. One person with millions of people who wanted to imitate that one person, and they revolutionized the whole industry. Think about that one person, millions of people who wanted to imitate that person, and they revolutionized the whole industry. 
push that out a little bit. One person, millions of people who want to imitate that person. Could we possibly change the world? One person, millions of people who want to imitate that person. Could we possibly change the world? I'm going to take you back to Philippians 3. And Paul starts with these words in the 17th verse. He said, brothers and sisters, join in imitating me. Now, it sounds a little bit self-serving and maybe a little bit egotistical. But immediately prior to that, in verse 12, he had talked about this sense of, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection by sharing in his suffering. Which means Paul wants to participate as fully as he can in the life of Christ. And so by saying, if you want to imitate me, what you, he's really saying is, I want you to imitate Christ, but who you get to see is me trying to be able to do it. So, brothers and sisters, join in imitating me, and observe those who have lived according to the example that you have in us. Which means that there are other people who are trying to live that kind of life. Now, if you back up into the first century, what we know about uh, following rabbis was this. It wasn't just about uh, learning what the rabbis knew in their heads and being able to articulate that and to agree with it. In fact, rabbis would encourage a lot of you know, very active conversation, sometimes conflictual conversation, because they wanted people to question it and to move on and to make it their own. But when their rabbis would ask someone to follow them, they were not just talking about what you have in your head, they were actually asking you to be like them. Could you live like them? Could you interact with the world like them? Could you be like them? So if you think about it, you ask the question, what did people who were invited to follow Jesus as the rabbi, what were they expecting? And what did they observe? And what were they invited to imitate? So if you read the Gospels, and friends, in this time where we're wondering sometimes what Christians are all about, just keep going back and reading the Gospels. Just read the Gospels. Read the Gospels. And what you'll see is this. So you have this Jesus who, in his interactions with people, here are the characteristics that you just see throughout uh, the Gospels. One, there is a compassion for those who are hurting. 5,000 people had gathered him with the hill. They were starved at the end of the day. The disciples said, get rid of them. Tell them to go back into their towns. And the words were this. Jesus had compassion on them. And so he ended up feeding them. Jesus had compassion for those who were hurting and hungry. Jesus desired justice for those who were outcasts. The first thing he said in Luke 4 was, I come, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's appointed me to bring good news to the poor and release captives. This is justice issue, justice language from the hearts of the prophets of the Old Testament. Justice for the outcast. Jesus also wanted us to have this, I think this deep sense of welcome for strangers. For people who had been ostracized or put off to the edge in any way in the culture, Jesus welcomed them. Jesus gave them a space to be. And Jesus also, uh, kind of at the heart of it was this. Jesus invited us to love like he loved. Chapter 13 of John's Gospel, by this everyone will know that you're my disciples if you have this love for one another. I invite you to love one another as I have first loved you. See the rhythm of discipleship, of following? It's about imitating. It's about observing. It's about imitating. It's about observing. That's the life that we've been invited into. Now, one of the things that was obvious for Paul was that he understood that if he was going to follow this kind of life, that it would in some ways bring him into conflict with the world around him. He would feel disconnected from some people. Uh, there would be a sense of dissonance or dis-ease in his own spirit. So listen to how he goes on in the 18th chapter. He says, many live as examples of the, or as enemies of the cross of Christ, which means that they, they're just living in opposition to the, the life that he has invited in, us into. And I have told you often about them, and now I tell you this, and listen to these, listen to these words. I tell you this even with tears. This broke the heart of Paul. When Paul, who was so engaged and, and 
doing the best he can to be part fully participating in the life of Christ and inviting people into that kind of life when there was in their, in their own life this disassociation maybe between some things that were part of the life of Christ and then some other ways that they weren't participating and they didn't regard it at all. It broke his heart. I wonder sometimes if Paul was going to take a look at who we are these days as followers of Jesus, uh, if some of those same tears would be falling. Paul goes on and says this. He gives us some specific examples. He said, uh, their end is destruction, which means that their, their life for themselves, the way that they're living, or how they're living in community is just not sustainable. It cannot be sustained. Their glory uh, is, or their, go their God is in their belly, which means they're gluttons. On the reverse side of that, probably people who aren't participating fully in feeding and giving to those who are poor and in need. And their glory is in their shame, which means that they're just pretty much into themselves. They want to be recognized and affirmed uh, for who they are and how great they are. Their minds, he says, are set on earthly things. Their minds are set on earthly things. So let me ask the question. How are we doing these days as followers of Jesus? How do you think we're doing imitating this Jesus who has invited us into this life and remember some of the qualities of that life? A life of compassion for those who are hurting, a life of justice for those who are uh, outcast, a life of welcome for those who are ostracized, and a life, of deep, a life of deep love for all people. How are we doing these days as followers of Jesus? I'd suggest even in the last few days as I've been watching the news cycle, there's just been some big news things that have not represented us very well if we think about the larger community. Uh, you look at the story uh, just in the past week about uh, Jerry Falwell Jr. who had to resign as president of Liberty University and uh, because over and over again essentially the things that he told people not to do he did and the things that he told people to do he wasn't doing. It speaks over time doesn't it? It says something about who we are and how we're allowing all of our lives in the best way that we can to be followers of Jesus. And here's a little local one. I was watching the Facebook posts of some people in the community that I most recently lived in, in Gehanna, Ohio. And there was a small Chinese restaurant, family owned. And of course, when the pandemic hit, they were just devastated with their business. They felt like they were just teetering at the edge. Uh, they got to the point where they were doing takeout and carry out orders and doing whatever they could to just stay afloat. Got to the point where they could open up in their, their state, but uh, the last recommendations were everybody who came into the building had to be wearing a mask. And so they were just doing their best to stay with the protocols and also get, keep their business going. Well, the story was about a woman who came in and she had on a shirt and a, a big bold shirt. And the shirt said this, uh, one cross plus three nails equals four given. We'll have an image of that shirt uh, on the screen so you can get a sense of it. You've probably seen something like this. And uh, you kind of know that people who are wearing shirts like that, they want to be recognized for the shirt that they're wearing in that way. So she was a Christian person. She was making a statement by the clothes that she was wearing. She was also not wearing a mask. She walked in to that establishment. And the person said, oh, I'm sorry, uh, we can't serve you without having a mask on. You could take, get takeout and get it out on the curb. You don't need a mask for that. But once you're inside, you have to wear a mask. And this woman went off. She said her religion doesn't allow her to wear masks. And I don't know where that came from, but basically that's what she was saying. Now, again, what happens is that people start associating that with who she is, right? And she started to scream and yell and say, I'm going to sue this place for not allowing me to, as a Christian person to be served. That had nothing to do with it. They just wanted her to wear a mask. 
But you see what that does? <sighs> All right, let me just say this, and I'll just be real blunt. If you're going to wear stuff that represents who you are as a Christian person, let me make a suggestion. Don't be a jerk. Seriously, just don't be a jerk. The messages that people receive from that are just not what we want to be able to, to live into in the best way that we can. And you wonder sometimes, how is it that we in the Christian community have allowed ourselves as Christians to, um, you know, to wear a shirt or to hold up a Bible or to put a pithy little statement on our, our bumper sticker and it gives us a whole bunch of excuses to act horribly. Hatefully, judgment, diminish others for who they are, exclude people from living the kinds of life that we want to be able to exclude. Think about what that says over time. Friends, how are we doing these days? Imitating the one who has invited us into a new life. Paul goes on and he says this. We have our citizenship. It's an interesting image, I'll get to that in a second. But our citizenship is in heaven. Now, what he doesn't mean by that is life is only gonna be good for us when we die and get to heaven. Uh, Dallas Willard describes it in this way. He said, uh, the point of the Christian life is not for us to get to heaven, like get our ticket punched and get to heaven. The point of the Christian journey is for the Spirit of God to open us up so that the heavenly life can become part of ours. We can take on the way of Jesus. We can participate more fully in the life that he had invited us to. We can, as Paul said in Philippians 2, we can put on the mind of Christ. So we are citizens of heaven, which means that we're formed and shaped in that way, and that's our first and highest calling. So interesting that he uses the concept of citizenship these days, and we're heading into what can be a very rough time in our country, uh, politically and also as people of God. And I would just invite you to consider this. Paul understood that he had dual citizenship. Paul was at one time a citizen of Rome, but he was also a citizen of the kingdom of God. And his citizenship in the kingdom of God always took priority, which means that his life was a pure invitation over and over again as he participated in the life of whatever community he was to be first framed by those very things we talked about earlier compassion for the hurting, justice for the outcast, welcome for the stranger, and love, love, love. We, friends, have dual citizenship. We are citizens of this country, and there will be a lot of things that we'll be asked to do uh, to live into our citizenship over these next month. But we are primarily, let me remind you, we are primarily citizens of heaven, which means citizens of the kingdom, which means citizens of the way of Jesus in this world. Our lives have been shaped in such a way that we are to be led by compassion, justice, welcome, and love. Paul goes back, I'll take you back to his first words. He just says this, uh, brothers and sisters, Join in imitating me, and I say this to you. Brothers and sisters, join in imitating Jesus. And observe those who live according to the example that you have in him. And think about this. One person with millions of people who are imitating him can change the world. We're going to invite you to hear a, a great old tune that comes, I think, even from maybe even the Baptist tradition. Uh, I've decided to follow Jesus. Lutherans get a little anxious about it at times because we believe, and I believe this to be true, is that Jesus first invites us to be part of this life and then gives us the encouragement by the work of the Spirit to lead it. But I think it's important in this sense. Every day, we're going to have to wake up and we're going to have to make these decisions. Will we live into a life of imitating who Jesus is? 
Will we allow the Spirit in to shape us in such a way that compassion, love, justice, and welcome will be a part of who we are? So listen, as we sing the song, I've decided to follow Jesus. responding to your movement with willing hearts and action. Today we pray for and entrust to you the community of Kenosha. We pray for Jacob Lake and his family. We pray for our black and brown sisters and brothers who feel the tremendous weight and impact of yet another act of needless violence. Spirit of God, work in the hearts and minds of those of us who navigate this world with privilege and power because of the color of our skin. Humble us, transform us. Give us courage to look not just to our own interests, but to the interests of others, so that our community communities may be made whole. Give us wisdom and persistence to change the systems that hold people down. Lord Jesus, you are the healer of our every ill. We entrust to you those who are impacted by hurricanes and wildfires, those who have experienced loss of any kind and are in a season of grief and mourning, those 
who are sick or burdened in any way, and the people who walk with them. We entrust to you our educators and families with school-aged children. We pray for wisdom and stamina and comfort in the face of anxiety and fear. In the quiet now, we each offer to you the prayers of our hearts. Thank you for being a God who desires us to come to you, who hears us, who is with us. Amen. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this. To remember me. Again after supper he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant, the new promise from God in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this to remember me. Please join me in praying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We invite you, as the music plays, to serve those you are present with, with the elements of Holy Communion.
Be imitators of Jesus' love and grace. Go in peace and serve the Lord. And together we say, thanks be to God.